very pleased to be involved in it. And uh, Emma, wherever she is, where is Emma? No, Emma's not here. Uh, 
of the event tonight. Um, one reader said, it's disgraceful that these buildings are going to be listed. So the worst buildings in the country. Nothing architecturally important about them other than how not to design buildings. <laughs> Scroll a bit further down. A huge amount of postmodernism wasn't really architecture at all. It was basically exterior decoration glued onto mundane, boring buildings which provided dismal interior spaces which had been considered for less than a minute and a half. By all means, preserve one or two of them for future generations to laugh at, but the rest of this is a Finally, a slightly more nuanced take on the subject. I loathe these postmodern <laughs> fantasies, lacking as they do in any architectural or intellectual rigor. But they are now part of our history, and as an admirer of brutalism, I have seen with sinking heart those buildings I love fall. Someone must love these too, and reluctantly <laughs> they should be preserved. So that's the kind of kaleidoscopic range of, uh, of emotions that postmodernism provokes. So is it a curiosity to be kind of reluctantly preserved against our better judgment, or is there actually merit in this most conflicted of periods that some of you are asking tonight? So each of the panel are going to give a five minute presentation, I'm going to provoke them a little bit, and then hopefully we'll have some comments, questions, and heckles. An audience, so please be thinking of points you want to challenge people on. So I think we're going to begin with Satari Farrell, and then we'll hand over to Adam, the co-author, <coughs> and then I think you, Elaine, and then Satari, over to you. Well, uh, I'm not going to say a great deal, because uh, I'm interested in what everyone else says. Uh, I, I, I'm interested in the fact that you have, uh, you quoted three relatively negative <laughs>
responding. Oh, uh, hi. And uh, I hand over to Adam to uh, comment on how he sees uh, looking backwards. Now, I was a participant along with people like uh, John Jenks and Ben Jones and the Venturis. Um, and Adam looks at it as a fresh air, a fresh art. Fresh air, right? <laughs> <laughs> fresh eyes. Uh, <laughs> these tired, tired, fresh eyes. Um, I, I, I guess um, before I went to architecture school, um, I'm just like, I think most architects, it's like for us, we just kind of like pull in with this, like, oh, buildings are so wonderful, walking around getting really excited about the city around us, and we're sort of like falling into the profession. Oh, yeah. um, and then you go to architecture school, and you, you I think a lot of us are uh, taught what, what is not worth appreciating. So, um, growing, up, growing up, what you shouldn't like, and um, growing up in London in sort of the late 80s and 90s, there were particular buildings which I absolutely adored. Like, just, you know, out of instinct. Just, you know, no, uh, no cultural people telling me that this was good or this was not good. And they so happened to be buildings like that one over there, um, the MI5 and Alban Gate, and numerous other projects which I didn't know were postmodern. They just happened to have color, forms which inspired my imagination. They were complex, both in terms of what they gave me visually, but also spatially. I don't know if any of you have been around, you should be around Embankment Place, but it's an incredibly complex urban composition. Really exciting. Went to my first nightclub there as well. <laughs> you guys know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, that's all in the same project with offices as well. Um, and then, you know, and I love these things. My parents are sitting in the front row, and they, you know, I, I, as an 11 year old, would drag them around to these these buildings, and they were just sort of like politely ignored at the weird child who just like these pink brown edifices so much. But I went, then I, you know, entered architecture school and had a very similar experience to a lot of people that I know, which was with, you know, I'd start to show things that I liked to the tutors, and they would just be like, that's disgusting, you shouldn't like that, that's terrible, it's bad architecture. So I stopped talking about these particular buildings for many, many years. Um, and then going through architecture school, I think I just sort of started to understand that. You know, people have really interesting ideas at any one given moment in architecture. There's particular problems which are being explored, which is all very valuable, but there's also a kind of derision towards what came before. It's almost like you have to kill your parents or something in architecture to be able to value what you do in the moment. So that, that's only the only valuable thing that can exist at one given time or somehow it's undermined. Um, and architecture has fashions like everything else. And so I started to doubt what I've been told in school, and I started to just go back to these things that I like so much. And think, well, why can't I? Why can't we like them? Why can't we revisit them? Why can't we investigate them? Why can't we question them? Why can't we study them? Um, and so it was very, 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 very exciting upon you know leaving university and then going out into the world to uh, eventually be approached by uh, Timothy Britton Hamlin, who's friends with Terry, saying, you know, this is, Terry's thinking about doing a book on postmodernism, which I at this point knew was what all those buildings were. <laughs> <laughs> And that just thrilled me, um, and you know, one thing led to another. But I think what Terry's, Terry had this brilliant idea that I think has come across so well in the book that originally I was just going to be assisting. But he, Terry had the idea of having this double perspective, which has actually come to be quite an important um, topic at the moment. And that is that the generation that comes immediately after, um, you know, so the people who were in university in the 90s, that postmodernism was the orthodoxy, it was the thing that they hated, right? They cannot have a historical and objective view about it. They're so passionately against what they feel like they killed and they've moved on from, that they cannot look at it with objective eyes, just dispassionately, like, you know, Denise Scott Brown saying, just look at it without judging. Look at something in the city without judging and see what's good and bad about it. They have to look at it <coughs> But my generation is different. We just look at these buildings and we just think, no, they're not they're evil, they're not immoral. It's buildings, and they're very interesting, and they're complex, and they deal with the city, and they deal with metaphor, and they deal with history, and all these things that, you know, Patrick Schumacher's architecture does, for instance, which is the dominant ideology of my university. Um, and so this double perspective is from that new generation, which is sort of without the weight on their shoulders of what's so bad, and then from, I think, a generation that has been slightly um, had their voice silenced for uh, just over a decade, or more than a decade, so the people who lived it. And I just think it's wonderful to skip a generation and have those two appreciative viewpoints that are so different and reevaluate it in a very, very positive way. So I'm very honored, and it's, it's really all thanks to Terry to, to have the idea to go ahead with it in that way. Excellent. We'll see you next.
Yeah. Have you been writing about architecture since postmodernism was as well, <laughs> twinkle in dark time? I was going to say, talking about twinkle in dark time, I mean, why are we all here talking when, frankly, he's in the back row there? <laughs> uh, because the first book I ever got given on architecture when I arrived in architecture magazine with my first job, and Peter Murray, then the editor, gave me for a Christmas present The Language of Postmodern Architecture by one Charles Jenks. Uh, which tells you nothing else that sort of my career has been bookended by uh, this particular way of doing things. But if you look at it, it's, it's um, later I started to try to get the first, I'm Charles on this book, me, I dare say, uh, the first, the earliest reference to the idea of architectural postmodernism. Uh, the earliest I've been able to trace it back to was uh, mentioned by Hevsner in a, one of his buildings of Britain guys in Norfolk early 50s, I think, in which he's using that term to describe the, I suppose, what we would now say vernacular housing of Taylor and Green in Norfolk. And then later, he used the term again, by this time, I think we're in the early 60s, to describe um, the work of Sterling and Gowan and of yeah. Smithson. And he explained it at that, at that point by saying that, for him, he thought, you know, effectively, the international style was the end of history, uh, but then this other thing is coming along now, which appears to be a kind of cult of personality, cult of architectural personality. Uh, I don't know if it's quite that, those, those words, but that was pretty much what he was saying. So he was you know, recognizing the phenomenon back then, if you like. And then there are other outliers. So the building I discovered, not I discovered, it's one of those ones which I, I think I've been to a lecture by Tim Cullinan way, way back in the early days. So he one of his, um, uh, okay, projection numbers on his Olivetti buildings for, well, his buildings for Olivetti um, around the country, the regional, the regional centres. And these were astonishing things with kind of some heavyweight concrete ground floor, lightweight prefabricated kit of parts, first floor for offices, and they were to be replicated in various places around the country in various ways. And I thought that's Jolly nice, and I remember all that, but they can't still exist, surely, particularly as Olivetti sort of basically didn't need them after about three years. And to my um, surprise, and it's not on the walls here, but um, it, uh, I stumbled across what the, what the one in Derby, if anybody can actually see that tiny picture there, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's like chinoiserie aspect to it. <laughs> and this was a building which was not just <coughs> Julian Wickham, because he ran a cop here, and there was all, not just Cullen. It was Julian Wickham, Chuck Tessé, Julian Picknell, Giles Oliver, all in the team um, wrestling, as I think uh, uh, often happened in the office, to um, get this design together. And to my surprise, I'm looking it up on um, Street View yesterday. Here it is. It was felt in today's environment. And new owners of it, who are one of these Olivetti buildings, became a Chinese restaurant, for instance. <laughs> That's why they are liar. The one in Dundee, I think, still exists, but in some reason, the one in Belfast has been hardly able to hang in brick, it's about to be divided. This one, however, has been looked after by new owners who are just chilled produce delivery people. They love the building so much, they got in covenants to sort of come along and advise them on restoration. And I see looking at Street View today that it's actually sort of now just been renamed the Olivetti Building. They see it with some pride, I think. But that was an outlier because that was 1971. And, uh, you know, in the way people tend to look at POMO is like commercial POMO of the early 80s. It's really the, uh, the commercial architecture of the Lawson boom before he moved on to the sort of the Lawson bust. And so it's a very short period, but the he starts switching out both ways, going back to uh, vernacular stuff in the 50s, Birmingham, the Smithsons, and then finally, I would just say, those buildings which we don't conventionally think of as being postmodern at all because they come from a different strand of architecture, but they so are. Lloyd's among them, but particularly Channel 4. Um, what a Baroque uh, building that is. Uh, and maybe we should just, you know, in conclusion, just sort of widen our ideas of, of exactly what uh, Homer means in this country. Excellent. Excuse me, can I interrupt? Please do. Yes. <laughs> I, I have to leave and I don't want it to be misinterpreted. It's Thanksgiving. Yeah. It's American. Thanks. And, and, no, thank Terry and Adam for producing a wonderful book. And what Terry said, I would like just to say a few words. 
about the origin of the word postmodern, which, of course, the German historians and uh, scholars have discovered. 1875, uh, it, it's, um, in, uh, it's in W11 somewhere. Uh, and there's uh, a, a painter named James Watkins Chapman, not a great painter, but who said, uh, I want to be postmodern, the capital P, capital M, more modern than the French, the Parisians, <laughs> in 1875. That is, he said something that uh, with post-impressionism and all the posties that came after was logically inevitable beyond, you know, ultra and so on. So the origins go on, but I think what really, I want to underline what Terry was alluding to, which is that actually what's fascinating to me, who's, uh, you know, been writing about it for a long time, is that it's the only word that has occupied a space that cuts across all of the different specialties. Uh, all of them. There's the postmodern dance, postmodern uh, geography, uh, so many. So postmodern architecture is one of the 70 posties which I listed <laughs> in my book on what is postmodern. And curiously, it's amazing that none of them talk to each other almost, first of all. And they all talk within their own little silos as if they're on Facebook. And <clears throat> That's a shame, because the postmodern is really about cutting across categories. Uh, you'll find in postmodern literature, this is a very big thing. And it's postmodern philosophy, it's postmodern cheese, kind of, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there really is postmodern everything. And it hasn't been like that since 1465, since Filarete said modern, OK? And all the Renaissance said modern, although it was called the rebirth. <laughs> It was moderna, moderno, and all the synonyms of modernism, which people have traced, Germans again, have traced back to the third century, and the Christians who claimed they were more modern than the Romans. Anyway, so much for labels. Uh, but I think the real news is that it is uh, about complexity, it is about cutting across, and it, it's interesting to me that architecture was very important because, in this overall history, because it was the first one to go, as it were, public, because architects have to design for the public. You know, and postmodern <laughs> painters don't have to do what, uh, they don't produce through mass production. They don't have to do surveys. They don't have to talk to the clients. And all the other arts don't face modernization <coughs> which means mass production. So the first postmodern postmodernization is, of course, uh, Marshall McLuhan, who said in 1965, <clears throat> you can manufacture 80 different tailpipes as quickly, efficiently, and beautifully as 80 similar ones. What's that called today? You know, that's called mass customization. 1965, polemicized by McLuhan in understanding meaning. So, you know, ever since modernization said you can only, you can have any color as long as it's black, or, you know, you can afford, um, you can have any color as long as it's Ford, uh, we now are out of that for industrialization reasons. You know, we're living in the third age of information. And, and this is much bigger than architecture, much bigger than Google or Facebook. It really cuts across everything. And in that sense, you know, Terry has said, we all of us are postmodern. Actually, Terry, you might have said on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. But on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you know, Norman, who uh, is still modernist, but the other days of the week, he is postmodern. So it's, anyway, I'll leave on. <laughs> writing for a long time about post 
1945 architecture and coming up to the late 70s, 1980s with a great big book called Space, Hope and Brutalism that followed on from a whole load of listing work for historic England or English heritage as it was then. But the great thing about working for historic England is that you have to do what's thrown at you. If the public says, please look at this building, you have to look at it and consider it. And that's why I think it's such a great place to work and, and, and learn from. And this is, it, you're never in your comfort zone for very long. And it's been exciting that, uh, I'm obviously disappointed, but so many buildings came from the postmodern persuasion came in for listing when they were <coughs> under 30 years old. And unless you could make a, a terrific case for them, like number one poultry, that they should be worth two star or higher, you have to wait till the, it's 30 years since the first concrete hit the trench. But now, um, I'm delighted that Historic England is undertaking the very first ever stylistic survey that we've ever done, which is on postmodern buildings. And it's been great to sort of carry on that story of what happened next because if you look at the old, the big old book, you'll see young Terry's work, you'll see the beginnings of Sterling and Gowan, and you want to know what happens next. And of course, it's a great opportunity to talk to living architects, to engage with a younger generation, and discover, um, as I saw last night, just how many new, new architects are still working in that job. So, I, what excited me too was that um, I was very worried. You know, when I read the language of postmodern architecture, he's gone. I can say this. Um, <laughs> that I was really upset about all the diggings and knocks that books on postmodernism used to make about modernism and high tech and earlier generations that they failed. And it's much more exciting, I find, to see all these, a, a, a whole range of architectural styles, yet Pesna is at fault, really, but making, trying to turn every sort of gropius and functionalism into the great god that that's what architecture <coughs> should be, which is why he was so against expressionism and brutalism and so forth. But coming out of that, I think we can now accept that there's a, a huge range of styles. And postmodern, for Geraint, Franklin, and me, started. We had to cut away, I'm afraid, from the philosophies and all the other um, different disciplines that discuss postmodern. Or I'd still have my head stuck in the book, unable to put pen to paper. But, Talking about modern um, architecture, I thought it was really important to distinguish that postmodern really meant a, a, the work of architects like Terry, Ed Jones, John Bertram, um, James Sterling, who by and large had gone through modernism and moved on and developed out of that a different history and um, symbolism, and that postmodern really was what it said on the tin. Have you changed your view since doing the work then? <laughs> do, do you now love, have you learned to love postmodernism? Oh, well, you always, if you work on something, yes, of course you, you, you do. <laughs> but actually, it was doing, putting together that cycle ride two years ago. I did a trip, Ollie came on my Pomo on Pedals ride from the 20th Century Society a couple of weekends ago. And it was actually going and looking at the buildings and going round them and putting together a narrative and a tour that really made me excited about them. Great. Ellie, how has postmodernism influenced your own work? What's your take on the period? Um, I guess, I don't know, I feel I'm straight in the middle somehow, kind of um, 
age wise and kind of, you know, the, the, the point in, in my practice really. Um, I, can't, I think I'm probably seeing as a young bachelor, <coughs> kind of age wise, I think I'm somewhere in the middle, but um, that's because uh, I actually came to architecture quite late. Um, <coughs> I was born in the early 70s, so I grew up, you know, through the